Welcome back, everyone. Um, it's been almost three weeks, so really excited to have this continue again. I had AP exams um, for the past two weeks, which is why I wasn't able to hold th these meetings um, for the past two weeks. But yeah, I'm glad that we're back. So let's get started. Um, so first of all, we're just going to do a short review of, oh shoot, there's still people coming in. Should I wait for one more minute? I'm going to wait for one more minute until 6.05. Okay, actually, on second thought, let's just go. Um, so since it's been quite a while, I just wanted to start this class by going over a short review of what consequentialism and deontology are. These two are not going to be the focus of what we're going to learn today, but they're going to be important. So just as a review, remember that consequentialism is the doctrine that the morality of an action is to be judged by its consequences. And then within consequentialism, we learned about utilitarianism, which is a type of consequentialism that says that an action is right if it promotes happiness or utility. And then finally, the second type of moral framework that we went over was deontology, which is the ethical theory that the morality of an action is determined by a series of rules, and that if something is wrong, then it's categorically wrong, regardless of consequences. Before we move on, does anyone have any questions on these two? Because we're going to be trying to apply them today in applied ethics. Okay, if anyone has any questions on these, um, feel free to ask whenever. So at the end of our last meeting, we actually, I was originally planning on talking about virtue ethics, which is the third prevalent type of moral framework. However, we got cut short due to the time. So I'm gonna introduce virtue ethics right now. So virtue ethics is another prevalent moral framework. It's one of the three developed by Aristotle and other ancient Greeks. It's the quest to understand and live a life of moral character. This character-based approach to morality assumes that we acquire virtue through practice. So by practicing to be brave or honest or just or generous, a person develops an honorable and moral character. So essentially, as the slide says, virtue ethics emphasizes virtue and moral character as opposed to consequences, like in consequentialism, or duties, like in deontology. So, Aristotle and other virtue ethicists would say, when we're asked to do an action, we have to ask ourselves, what would a virtuous person do? And so just like the other key frameworks, this is a very basic version of this. Um, however, there's some key clarifications that we should go over. The first clarification is that when virtue ethicists, or at least when Aristotle was talking about virtues, he's talking about virtues in moderation, meaning that he thinks that it's important to have a balance of virtues, not to be on either extreme. To give an example, let's take the virtue of bravery. Aristotle's conception of bravery is in the middle, kind of. You can't be too brave, otherwise that would be rash, and you can't be too not brave, because that would be cowardly. So another important thing to keep in mind is that um, one prevalent branch of virtue ethics seeks to um, seeks eudaimonia. The term eudaimonia is an ancient Greek term for flourishing or well-being. So essentially, a lot of virtue ethicists think that the purpose of life isn't to achieve some consequence or to do some duty, but to achieve human flourishing. So that might have been confusing to some of you. Um, I'd imagine that you have questions, but we're not actually going to be focusing on virtue ethics um, as a moral framework today. So before I move on, does anyone have any questions about virtue ethics? Okay, and for those of you who are just joining in, we just did a review of deontology, consequentialism, and then we're going over virtue ethics right now. Okay, that's it from the stuff that we didn't finish last class. Oh wait, no, 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 sorry, another thing. So. Last week, I sent a homework document that was entirely optional, but it was some interesting pieces that you could write about if you wanted to. So if you did that, I'd really appreciate it if you could email it to my email, which I'll type in the chat. The reason is because 
the teen civic engagement program that I run in the Bay Area, we actually maintain a newsletter that's being distributed by our city library. So if you were to email some of your responses to me, I think it would be interesting and meaningful for us to feature it in the newsletter if possible. So yeah, once again, go ahead. Did someone say something? Okay, yeah. So if anyone did that, please do email it to me. And I'll repeat this again at the end of class, seeing that some people are still coming in. Okay. So the central topic today that we're gonna discuss is animal rights. Animal rights is a very prevalent question in applied ethics. So applied ethics is just ethics except applying it to the real world. And the reason we're going over animal rights is because it's, well, first of all, it's not that controversial, like no one gets too upset over it. But second of all, it's something that we encounter in our day-to-day -day lives. Like most cultures normalize eating meat. However, it's really hard to justify eating meat. So we're trying to bridge that moral gap. Um, do you all know about Crash Course? We're going to watch a video from Crash Course about this. Um, hold on. Okay. And please tell me if you can hear the video. Can you guys Remember hear the video? Cecil the lion. A lot of people were shocked. Who can not hear the video, if anyone? Okay. Um, if you have difficulties hearing the video, here's the link. You can feel free to watch it by yourself as well. Here, let's go. Remember Cecil the lion? A lot of people were shocked, even outraged, when they heard about his death at the hands of an American hunter in 2015. The response to the lion's death was so strong that the guy who shot Cecil basically went into hiding until he issued an apology. But isn't that a little bit strange? We react with horror when we hear about a majestic lion being shot, or sacks of kittens being tossed into rivers, or owners training their dogs to fight each other for sport. But what is the difference between killing Cecil and killing a deer, or a duck, or a cow? or a chicken. How do we reconcile the strong feelings many of us have about certain animals, mainly the cute ones like kittens and puppies, with the way we actually use animals in our own lives? Most of us think nothing of using non-human animals for their meat, milk, or skins, and not only do we use animals in these ways, but using them as we do almost always harms them. A common method for testing cosmetics, for example, involves restraining rabbits and putting the product into their eyes, leaving it for a set amount of time, and then washing it out and checking for ill effects. I bet they're used for this because they don't have tear ducts, so they aren't able to flush the product out of their eyes the way our eyes would. It may not surprise you to hear that this can be extremely painful and often blinds the rabbits, which are then euthanized. On factory farms, chickens are housed in tiny cages with each bird occupying a space the size of a piece of standard printer paper. Their beaks are often cut down to keep them from pecking each other, and when they're no longer laying enough eggs, they're killed. These are just a couple examples of the conditions animals experience at our expense, and they're not unusual. We'd never dream of using another human being in these ways, but we think nothing of doing it to non-human animals. So how do we let ourselves do that? Contemporary Australian philosopher Peter Singer uses the word speciesism to describe giving preference to our own species over another in the absence of morally relevant differences. Singer reminds us that there was a time when most Americans thought it was totally normal and right for members of one group to literally own members of another group based on a morally irrelevant difference, skin color. And today, the members of the oppressing group look back on the reasoning of their ancestors with horror and shame. Well, Singer predicts that there will be a time when our descendants look back on us and our treatment on human animals with the same reaction. In a nutshell, Singer says, if it's not okay to do it to a human, it's not okay to do it to an animal either. Now, you might think you agree with him, because who doesn't love bunnies and kittens? But do you really agree with him? Do you agree that we should treat like cases of and that a difference in treatment requires a morally relevant difference. And you have to identify the differences that justify treating non-human animals in ways that we never expect humans to. One arbiter you might use to justify the difference is intelligence. There's no question that as a species, our intelligence trumps that of every other species on the planet. But we don't normally think that intelligence is a good way for deciding how you get treated. Dystopian novels like Brave New World bring out the visceral distaste we have for that kind of intelligence-based caste system. So if it's clearly wrong to treat members of our species differently based on intelligence, why be okay to treat them to other species differently? 
on that same basis. Well, one response might be to argue that the difference in intelligence between the smartest and the least smart humans is much smaller than the intelligence gap between humans and other species. But empirically, that's not true. Sure, most humans fall within the same general range of intelligence, but some humans are profoundly cognitively disabled, and some animals, particularly primates, are probably more intelligent than those severely impaired humans. So that argument doesn't hold up. But maybe you think we should treat other animals the way we do just because we can. Contemporary American philosopher Carl Cohen, for example, calls himself a proud speciesist. He argues that every species is struggling to claw its way to the top, and that's how it should be. Every species ought to be concerned about protecting itself, he says, and since humans are currently at the top, well, that means that we're the best, so we can pretty much do whatever we want to other beings. The problem with this reasoning is you'd almost certainly not be okay with it if you weren't a member of the privileged species. Remember, this is the exact argument that was given by slave owners to justify their domination of Africans and indigenous people. So if you don't normally think might makes right, then wouldn't it be hypocritical to use it as a justification in this case? Yet another rationale is that this is the way it's always been. And it's true, humans have been dominating non-human animals for a really long time. It's part of our culture and entire ways of life are based on it. Farmers, ranchers, fishers, and so on. But arguments from tradition are always philosophically suspect. The mere fact that something has been a certain way for a long time says nothing about whether it's good. And once again, that was the same argument we've been using slavery. And yes, the abolition of slavery was economically costly and a huge disruption of slave-owning culture, but I think we all agree it was totally worth it. Still, one of the strongest arguments for our uses of non-human animals is the argument need. Most people believe that we're justified in doing what it takes in order to survive. In fact, most people even think it's okay to kill another human in the name of self-defense. This argument doesn't justify using animals for non-necessary things like cosmetics testing, but eating is a necessity, so there's nothing wrong with eating animals, right? The problem is we know humans can be perfectly healthy without eating animals. So yes, you need to eat, but you don't need to eat animals. For his part, Singer says we should think about the treatment of non-human animals in terms of an equal consideration of interests. This means that identical interests should be given equal weight, regardless of what type of being they occur in. Of course, humans have all sorts of interests that animals don't have. Some of us have interests in going to college and voting and getting married, and non-human animals don't have an interest in doing those things, so we don't have any obligation to help them do that. There is an interest that we all share. We have an interest in avoiding pain. Singer's utilitarian ancestor, Jeremy Bentham, said, The question is not, can they reason, nor can they talk, but rather, can they suffer? Because we are all alike in our capacity to suffer and in our desire to avoid suffering. Utilitarians like Bentham and Singer say that we need to equally consider that interest and that we are unjustified in preferencing human interests over non-human ones. Now, to be clear, as utilitarians, these thinkers would never issue an out-and-out -out prohibition on the use of non-human animals. What they're against is the unthinking assumption that animals are at our disposal. Since they're in the group of things that feel like humans, they must be factored into the utilitarian calculus. So if the issue is really about need, if you're literally starving and the only thing around to eat is an animal, they'd argue that you're morally justified in eating it, because the suffering involved in your death by starvation would outweigh the suffering of the animal. The problem is that for most people in the industrialized world today, it's not about need, it's simply about taste and convenience and how things have always been done. But let's head over to the Thought Bubble to look at this from another angle in this week's Flash Philosophy. Here's Fluffy. She's been your close companion since she was a kid. You love her very much and you've given her the best life you could. But now, Fluffy is nearing the end of her life. You'll care for her until the end, but when she dies, why not eat her? I mean, unless you're a vegetarian, there seems to be no good reason that you'd be repelled by this idea, but you almost certainly are. Take some time here to think about why that is. It can't be about harm, because Fluffy is already dead. She can't feel pain. Maybe you're appealing to some sort of principle of respect for the dead, but we know that some cultures think the best way to respect the dead is to consume their flesh. So if you're only not eating her because you have a thing against eating cats in particular, but you're okay with eating other animals, that seems pretty speciesist. It's just that the species that you're giving preference to are both humans and cats, but you're still a speciesist. Thanks, Thought Bubble. Okay, so Singer has given us some pretty strong reasons to reevaluate our treatment of non-human animals. I'm thinking 
Why should I care? What if I don't care that I'm a speciesist? I like eating meat and feel no shame about it because everyone I know eats meat too. Well, the thing is, philosophers want you to be consistent with your beliefs. They want you to think about why you think it would be wrong to eat fluffy or why you wouldn't eat dog meat if it was served to you or why you were upset about Cecil the lion and yet you have no problem eating, say, bacon, even though dogs and pigs have the same level of cognition and awareness. Philosophers want you to be able to justify your actions, to give reasons for what you do. So if you're saying that reasons don't matter, that you can just do what you want even if your actions are internally inconsistent, then not only are you not doing philosophy, well, you're sort of opting out of rational discourse altogether. Because if these reasons don't matter, then why should any reasons matter? If I want to be a racist or a homophobe or a sexist, and I'm comfortable with it because the people I hang out with have those attitudes too, well, conversation's sort of over. Scrutinize your own actions, not just regarding non-human animals, but in most areas of your life. Today, we learned about moral consider. Okay, great. That was a video. Thanks, John Green. Um, let's see. I think a couple of people joined during the video. So I'll just give a quick recap of what the video went over. Essentially, it went over the main debate between both both people supporting animal rights and people against animal rights. And the video brings up several key questions. For example, it brings up the topic of speciesism. Um, are we being speciesist, sorry, species, speciesist by favoring certain animals ah! over others? Um, and it brings up questions like, why is it okay for us to eat animals? Why would it not be okay for us to eat like our dead pet? Questions like that. So these are the questions that we're going to be exploring today. The first main question is a question that John Green raises, and that's what makes non-human animals different than humans, if anything? So in this slide, I compiled several of the reasons on the top of my head that could make animals different from non or sorry, non-human animals different from humans. It could be like intelligence, suffering, emotion, consciousness, constants, um, genetic similarity, etc. So what do you guys think about this question? What does make non-human animals different from humans? Anthony, go ahead. A uh, lack of civilization. Like they haven't developed a society. Hmm. Okay. That's an hmm. Okay, that's a valid answer. Ariel says weapons to kill. Okay, actually, let me let me be more clear. What I mean is what makes animals morally different from humans? Why should we treat them morally different? Or are we morally the same? We are the same. Okay. Sure. So why do you, why do you think that we are the same? And if so, what are the implications do you think? Okay, let's see. So someone says in the chat, for the most part, animals don't look far into the future while humans make future plans. Hmm. So would that be like intelligence? That seems mostly like intelligence, right? And also, yeah, some animals do make future plans. Does anyone disagree with these? Like who thinks that there's who thinks that there is a moral difference between non-human animals and humans that isn't in this list? Um, the communication, so someone says the communication that they can't convey their suffering, thoughts and feelings to animals, so we feel less bad. Okay, sure, um, that's true, but I'm more trying to ask, like, what should we be doing, not what should we be feeling? Um, so if all that's different between humans and animals is communication, then is that a moral difference or is that just a superficial difference? Okay, Isobel, I think I get your point, but I feel like that's kind of just intelligence, right? Because intelligence covers a broad range of things. Okay. So once again, does anyone have any different ideas besides the ones I have on this list? 
because there's definitely a lot out there that have been used to justify the moral difference.